You are listening to a sermon from the First Baptist Church of Ewing, a Christ Center church in Lewis County. So there are many ways to misinterpret or misunderstand the Bible. Uh, Many non-Christians often misread it or even dismiss it altogether as nothing more than a myth or a fairy tale. Uh, Perhaps, you know, there are some morals or values to take away from Scripture, uh, but, but you shouldn't take it literally. But, but even within the Christian faith, uh, there are still a number of ways to misinterpret Scripture as well. E- even if you, you take it as the inerrant word of God, uh, there are still many ways to misread uh, his word. A, a common way is to, to see the Bible through a human-centered lens rather than a God-centered lens. You know, it is a predominantly, it's it's a story that is more about man than God. It's more man-focused than God-focused. Many Christians do this when they read their Bible, uh, even without realizing it. Uh, For example, you put yourself in the place of every hero that you come across in Scripture. Uh, You you read the story of Abraham nearly sacrificing his son Isaac, and you assume the role of Abraham in the text. Uh, The moral takeaway of the story is that you need to have more faith like Abraham and be willing to sacrifice even that which is most important to you. Or you read, maybe you read the story of David and Goliath, and you put yourself in the place of David. And you start looking around your life to see all of the giants that need to be slain. But the Bible is not a man-centered book. Uh, God's word is a gift given by God that is about God. He may have given it to you to read, but it is his autobiography. God is the hero of every story. God is Abraham, not you. He was the one willing to sacrifice even his own son. God is David, not you. He is the one who has already slain the greatest giant that is sin and death when he defeated it on the cross. I begin with this reminder and this truth because Nehemiah is another story that is easy to falsely misinterpret if you're not careful. It's a story about a man who is sent to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And if you're not careful, it's easy to run to the assumption that you are intended to be Nehemiah in this story. And so you're going to begin to to look around to see what all the Lord has called you to rebuild and fix in your own life and what you're supposed to fix in the life of everybody else around you. Uh, But you are not Nehemiah in this story. Uh, If you want something analogous to yourself, uh, you are actually more akin to Jerusalem. You are that city that has been burned to the ground and plundered. You're that city that has been left naked and exposed to the world uh, without walls to defend yourself. And God is the, the gracious Nehemiah who has come to rebuild that which has been broken. Uh, that, that's the main idea of our passage this morning. We're going to walk through this story with a God-centered approach, seeing what, what he is going to rebuild. Uh, I want you to see in this story God's grace, God's vision, 
and how ultimately it's all going to be accomplished by God's hand. So let me begin by reading our text this morning. We're primarily looking at uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Uh, Actually, I'm going to start reading that last little bit of the last verse uh, in chapter 1, and then I'll I'll read chapter 2. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Now I was the cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me and the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they uh, may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. Then I carried, or then I came to the governors in the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Hornite and and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose uh, late in the night and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night, the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gate that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool But there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I turned back and I entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. uh, And I did not uh, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them. You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But then Sanballat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it. They jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So let's begin looking at the story by seeing God's grace. If there is one way that you are like Nehemiah in this story, it's that both you and Nehemiah have been supernaturally sustained by God's grace. 
God exiled his people as the prophet predicted, uh, as, as the yeah, prophet Jeremiah had predicted for 70 years. Uh, the Israelites were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, uh, and then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and Cyrus the Great uh, finally allowed the people to return. But, but during the exile, just because the Lord had rejected his people did not mean that the Lord had neglected his people. Uh, we saw last week looking uh, at Zedekiah, uh, e- even though Zedekiah was taken away in chains, Jeremiah was released from his and given freedom to go wherever he chose. Also during the exile, there was a man by the name of Daniel who will come to rule in a very prominent position in the Babylonian government, uh, as well as his companions, Shadmach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And a Jewish woman named Esther will become a queen over the Persian Empire. Though God had exiled his people as a punishment for sin, God was still gracious to his people. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. This was like being the head of the secret service. It was his job to ensure that the king's wine and provisions had not been poisoned. Uh, This was a a very lucrative and highly regarded position. Uh, It was only given to those who were trusted thoroughly by the king. So so by God's grace, it is clear that, that Nehemiah isn't just surviving He is thriving. And when it comes to to seeing God's grace, I think every Christ follower falls into one of two categories. God's grace either seems to always be in short supply or in unlimited abundance. You either always see a scarcity or a surplus of God's grace and his blessings in your life. There are those who only want to focus on the brokenness of the world because exile doesn't feel like Eden. But there are also those who focus on the abundance of the God-given treasures in their life rather than on those thorns and thistles of our fallen world. Let let me just argue this morning that, that if you were to tally up all of the gifts of grace that you have been given by God, even though you did not deserve them, and you were to compare them and weigh them, against any afflictions that you may be facing, those scales always are going to lean in favor of God's grace. Even even when you don't see it, even when you don't always recognize it, even when sometimes it doesn't feel like it, even sometimes when, when you are very aware that that, that you have been exiled from God's presence and you live in a fallen, broken, and sinful world, despite any affliction that, that you might uh, appear to be facing today, you are still surrounded by God's grace. You are sustained by God's grace. You are swimming in an ocean of God's grace. Even in exile, God graciously provided for Nehemiah and his people. And even though we have been exiled from God's presence because of our sin, and though we now live in a wicked and cursed sinful world 
he is still gracious to provide for each and every one of us. If you're in this room this morning listening to me right now, that means that that you have life and health enough to be here, to to make it here. If, If you're in this room right now, it means that you're living in a country that has given you more religious freedoms than have been afforded by most Christians throughout the history of the church. And if you have submitted to Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have been offered the greatest gift of grace that exists, which is an eternity of freedom spent with God himself. And because of that reality, the Christian world should leave no room for pessimism. Let me, let me say that again. The, the Christian worldview should leave no room for pessimism. If you're a perpetual pessimist, stop it. The, the Christian worldview leaves no room for this because you serve a God of hope. You have been given a gospel of hope. Hope, And it's that gospel that sustains you throughout this broken world. So so we as Christians, even in a fallen, sinful world, even when there are afflictions, we are to be an optimistic people known for our hope. Even during this darkest chapter of Israelite history, the Lord was gracious to provide for Nehemiah far beyond what he deserved. And no matter what dark season you may feel like your life is in now, it pales in comparison to the bountiful blessings that God has already given you and those blessings that he offers you through Christ. Even in exile, Nehemiah sat on a stockpile of surplus grace, and so do we. So first, that was God's grace. But let's also look to the story to see God's vision. Just as his grace was far greater than Nehemiah deserved, so is this vision far bigger than Nehemiah could have imagined. Despite the grace in Nehemiah's own life, uh, he still longs to see the honor of his people restored. Even though Nehemiah has found favor in the eyes of the king and the eyes of the Lord, many of God's people still live in the slums of a shattered capital. After 70 years in exile, King Cyrus has began to, he began to allow the Jewish people, the Jewish refugees to return to Jerusalem. But even after these refugees have now returned, their city is still without walls. And without walls for protection, the inhabitants of Jerusalem will live in constant fear of enemy attack. Uh, Without walls, merchants are going to be hesitant to do business in a city where their goods could be so easily plundered. So, So though Nehemiah is thankful for the life that he has been given in exile, We're still told in chapter 2 that as he goes before Artaxerxes to perform his duties as cupbearer, he is sad in the presence of the king. Uh, Chapter 1, Nehemiah had just been visited by his brother uh, Hanani, who told him reports of the shame of his people. And so now, even in the king's presence, Nehemiah can't help but become overcome with sorrow and grief. And Artaxerxes asks him uh, the reason behind this sadness. 
And and Nehemiah is afraid to tell him the truth. Because telling him of the disgrace of Jerusalem and requesting permission to rebuild the walls, that request in and of itself could be taken as an act of treason. The defenses of Jerusalem were destroyed so that the inhabitants and so that that Israel could never again mount a rebellion. And if Nehemiah asks permission to rebuild, then he is running the risk of sounding like a potential rebel. But Nehemiah says a prayer to the Lord and he makes his request anyway. He responds very diplomatically, uh, but he makes his request. He doesn't mention anything about the city walls, but he asks permission to rebuild the city where his forefathers' graves lay in ruin. And in return, Nehemiah not only receives permission to rebuild Jerusalem, uh, but he also receives letters to, to, to give to all of the governors, letting them know that this project has personally been approved by the king. And, and Nehemiah is even furnished with wood from the king's personal forest to aid in this construction. This should be a reminder that God's vision to restore the lives of his people who have been ruined by sin, it is a far greater and grander vision than you could fathom. God didn't just use Nehemiah to rebuild these walls. He used the treasury and the resources of a foreign nation to pay for it. And when Christians envision how the Lord's kingdom might expand and grow in our own communities, we we seldom often have too great a vision. We, We seldom have too great a vision. Far too often our vision is far too limited. It's not that we hope for too much. It's usually that we hope for too little. The the prophet Habakkuk is a prime example of this. Uh, Like Nehemiah, Habakkuk had cried out to the Lord about the brokenness and the destruction surrounding him and his people years before. Habakkuk worried that the Lord was idle and death to his people's plea for aid. But in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, the Lord responds to the prophet by saying this. He says, Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Even if the Lord told Habakkuk all that he was about to do, he wouldn't have believed him. And those in Nehemiah's day, the the residents living among the broken rubble in their former capital, many could not have fathomed the plans that the Lord had to restore the city's former glory. If you went and told them that the Persians of all people were personally going to give permission and even provide the necessary supplies to raise up Jerusalem from its ashes, they they would have laughed in your face. And the magnitude of God's vision for his people today continues to be such that it still cannot be fully comprehended. The the gospel is a God-sized vision that encompasses every people, every tongue, every nation. From towns as small as Ewing to cities as large as New York, uh, 
to places as near as Lewistown, to places as far away as Lebanon. There is no vision broader in scope than the gospel of God. There is nothing deeper, nothing wider, nothing more astounding, nothing more intimidating, nothing greater than that which stems from the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And if that gospel is not your vision, and if that's not the vision of our church, then we have a vision that is too small. If the gospel is not your vision, then your vision is too small. If the highest hopes of your achievements is just to go on a short-term mission trip somewhere and build an orphanage or work in a soup kitchen once a week, you have set your sights far too low. I mean, those, those can be wonderful accomplishments, uh, but if that is all your plans entail, uh, th- then you have cast for yourself a miniature, man-sized vision. The, the Lord has much greater plans in store. The, the, the marriages that he wants to rebuild, the families he wants to restore, the eternal hope and joy and peace that he wants to provide, that's God's vision. So you've seen his grace, you've seen his vision. Let's look to see how it will all be accomplished by God's hand. After receiving permission from the king, Nehemiah travels to Jerusalem to set to work. Uh, He tells no one of his plans Uh, But during the night, he rides around on the city, seeing the damage for himself. And afterwards, he he finally gathers the Jewish nobles and all of the officials of the city. And then starting in verse 17, he says, You see the trouble that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of, of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words of the king that had, he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Though the people knew the, the dire state of their city, when, when they heard that the hand of God had been with Nehemiah and how by God's grace, even the king gave his support for this project, the people were willing to rise up and build. And it's vital that the inhabitants of Jerusalem saw that Jerusalem wouldn't be rebuilt by the hands of Nehemiah, but rather by the hands of God Because just as soon as the walls, uh, the work on the walls began, so too does the opposition begin. Starting in verse 19, you read, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. The the Israelites weren't the only people living under Persian rule. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem all came from other people that had also been conquered by foreign powers. Many of their own cities also had been laid waste by either the Babylonians or the Persians. Uh, Sanballat and Tobiah even came from people that the Lord had commanded to conquer when the Israelites first entered Canaan. 
And now, as it's the Israelites themselves that have been cast out of the land, these long-standing enemies of the Lord do everything in their power to keep Jerusalem from being rebuilt. If their capitals are in ruin, they want Jerusalem to be in ruin as well. As you read through the story of Nehemiah, you see that, that Sanballat and his companions, uh, they, they use their political influence. They blackmail uh, Jewish nobles. Uh, they even send out false prophets against Nehemiah. So, so just because God had given Nehemiah this grand vision, that, that doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy vision to bring to fruition. There is a lot of opposition, and without the very hand of God, Nehemiah will not have success. We read later in chapter 4 of the constant vigilance that Nehemiah and his people must have as they rebuild these walls. Starting in verse 16, let me read to you in chapter 4. It says, Half my servants worked on construction, And half held the spears, the shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. So those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. Nehemiah and his men built with a sword in one hand and and their tools and trowels in the other. With with one hand, they're they're ready to build up the walls of Jerusalem, and with the other, they are ready to cut the enemy down. I said at the very beginning that, that you are not intended to be Nehemiah in this story. I said that, that God is the hero here, and if that's true... Then, then the sword and the tools and the trowel held by the hands of God must be the very word of God. His word is like a trowel in your life. It spreads the mortar, it lays the foundation in your heart so that, that you might be equipped and built up for the Christian life. But but it's also a sword intended to cut to the heart and tear down that rebellious nature of sin. When my wife and I first got married, uh, we wanted to begin studying scripture together. uh, And Nehemiah was the first book that we decided to walk through uh, as a couple. And we chose that book because of all of this vivid imagery and these wonderful reminders contained within this story and what we knew it would mean for our marriage. There's a realization here that that it's not enough to watch the hand of the Lord build up your life or your marriage if you're just going to let the enemy tear it all down before the project's even complete. And it doesn't do you any good to stand vigilantly on guard against the enemy if you're not actually guarding against anything. If you're not actually letting the Lord establish and build his kingdom and your life or the life of your family, it does you no good to guard against that which is not being built. The the Christian life is always simultaneously a life of progressing forward in sanctification and being ever vigilant to defend and protect the work that the Lord is doing and has already done in your life. Uh, One without the other will mean that your life will just fall back into ruin or that process of sanctification will never get off the ground to begin with. The Christian life takes both 
And it can only be accomplished by the hands of God and the word of God. So we've seen this morning that that the Old Testament is not a story that ends in despair. Ultimately, it ends with a God who restores and who has rebuilt that which had been broken. And to see that, we've looked at God's grace and his vision and how all of this will be accomplished only by his hands. I want to end by giving you a bit of a foreshadow to how not just the Old Testament story ends, but how all of Scripture concludes. Because the New Testament is also a story that will not end in despair. Let me finish with a selection from uh, Revelation chapter 21. Uh, In Revelation, John writes this. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the whole city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then describing the city, John goes on to write, he says, its radiance was like the most rare jewel, like a a jasper clear as crystal. Uh, it, It had a great high wall with 12 gates. Uh, The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. Uh, The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysopress, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls in each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And then finally in verse 25, uh, he concludes, and the city gates will never be shut, and there will be no night there. That's the the vision of New Jerusalem that you receive. Just as God ends the Old Testament by restoring the walls of Jerusalem in the eternal dwelling place of man in God, in New Jerusalem, he will adorn the walls of the city with every beauty and every treasure that exists. And the only construction project that will not be needed there is to rebuild the Lord's temple because there will no, be no need for a temple because God himself will be that temple. And there will be no need to shut the gates in those walls or of that city because all of the enemies of the Lord will have been defeated and they will have been cast far, far away. That is our ultimate vision and hope in New Jerusalem. Let me pray.